Чи тут нема гучно? О, гучно мовиць тут є. No. Yeah, I will, I will, uh, or no, probably I will give this to you and Dennis. Yeah. <coughs> We start our working day. Good afternoon, everyone who joined us, and uh, to those who will watch us online later on. The discussion about the defense industry reform is a key element of launching, uh, enhancing Ukraine's defense capabilities. Our guest, Alexander Daniluk, head of the Center for Defense Reform, Sylvie Karber, president of the Potomac Foundation, and Denis Grak, the senior research fellow of the Potomac Foundation. Welcome. Good afternoon. Let me tell you about our guests. In order that you understand the topic of the discussion, today we have uh, Dr. Philip Carver, the president of uh, the Potomac Foundation, a person who during his life worked a lot as a strategic advisor at the level of presidents, heads of Western nations, and he was the advisor to Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. And uh, also he closely cooperated and continues cooperation directly with the defense and security agencies of the NATO countries the Ministry of Defense of the USA and the Ministry of Defense and the general staffs of different countries. He also is an advisor at different NATO um, countries and our allies. And Dr. Carver is a big friend of Ukraine and uh, he works continuously and uh, he came to Ukraine with the start of Russian aggression in April 2014 when uh, Dr. Garber together with uh, General Wesley Clark they wrote their report on the necessity to help our country and they initiated uh, uh, congressional hearings and appropriate decisions were taken by the USA to support our country in the course of these uh, hearings. Uh, there were some declarative issues and also practical issues were raised and uh, these issues were pressing in 2014 and uh, these uh, um, issues were, in a good sense, lobbied by Carper and uh, uh, his colleague, and um, also uh, they uh, promoted lethal weapon provision to Ukraine, and uh, they spoke about javelin, and uh, uh, now they officially came to our country. And. Uh, anti-artillery raiders and some other items that are now on the inventory of the help that is provided. And we are really grateful to Professor Carbert for his uh, role in order to counteract in this difficult political situation. And this is the third visit of Dr. Carbert to Ukraine. And uh, maybe he is the only one among the foreigners not many uh, people except Ukrainian servicemen spent so much time at the front line he was even injured near Volnavaha that's why we may say that to some extent Dr. Kaber is the veteran of Russian and the Ukrainian war. Excuse me. Maybe Putin phones us in order to disrupt our press conference. Denis Gurak, well known to everybody. He was deputy head of the state concern Ukrabaron Prom and he was responsible for the whole foreign policy, not only trade but all 
political aspects of these issues. So why did we decide to take this topic for today's discussion and why we are speaking about the reform of the uh, defense industry, that this is a key element of enhancing Ukraine's defense capability. There are several aspects. The first one, it is clear. We have an acute issue to rearm our army in order to provide those means that are necessary both for rebuff of the Russian aggression against our country and also in order to increase capabilities in order to restore the territorial integrity of our country and to implement the strategy of security in the country. And um, also one more question that is not so clear for the audience and maybe this issue is even more important than the increase of defense capabilities of the armed forces of Ukraine. We clearly understand that economy of war, it lies in the foundation of the defense capability of our country and we understand that now Ukrainian defense industry has interesting developments and it is able to develop and provide the most modern pieces of ammunition but uh, the state needs uh, financing for this and uh, one aspect we want to discuss is how Ukrainian defense uh, industry this is uh, the unique uh, export-oriented area in our country and it can become a driver for the whole economy and this way it can provide and uh, it can bring money that, uh, that is needed to provide uh, for the security and defense sector on the whole. So we are going to speak about this today and I give the floor to my colleague Denise Gurak. Uh, good afternoon everyone. I would like to give historic uh, retrospective about this. So what happened uh, when the aggression started and what situation we have now in the defense sector and in the reform of the sector. Uh, a lot has been done for stabilization of the situation in order not to allow um, the destruction of um, capabilities and I believe that due to Ukrainian defense industry we were able to rebuff Russian aggression because we didn't have much help from the allied countries. But taking into account that we have some grounds, the foundation was led for the further development. The key issue is the necessity to continue with reforms and to have some legislation that has been developed for some years and uh, these draft documents are ready for adoption. They are different levels of adoption and they are in the expert community but I would like to divide all this in four blocks. For the first block is uh, corpor corporatization and restructuring of the defense industry enterprises and the airspace industry and uh, um, the reform should be done not only in defense industry it should go further and also the adoption of law on the production of military equipment because we are in the legal vacuum now and the adoption of law on uh, military um, and defense cooperation and these documents were developed and they are the cabinet of ministers and this is the strategic um, interest of the state to uh, regulate the situation the soon, uh, as soon as possible. And the fourth block, this is price formation and liberalization of trade, both internal and external, because 
in domestic market we have big problem. This is uh, an ability at uh, enterprises to plan the costs for production and to produce because there are limitations and the system of uh, regulation of these mock-ups, uh, it is really difficult. And uh, you know that uh, profile associations deal with it, Alcarabur and Prom deals with it, but uh, this issue remains unresolved and this prevents further development because it doesn't allow to provide uh, this uh, because margin is too big. This is the big problem. And uh, another issue is liberalization of foreign trade that should go hand in hand with the legislation concerning the uh, laws on the um, production uh, of uh, military equipment and cooperation in the military sector, so to provide opportunity to those who produce uh, military equipment to um, import this uh, spare parts and to um, export uh, the military equipment. So these are the four blocks. And all this is for one goal, is the creation of investment capabilities, opportunities in Ukraine and for aerospace industry as well. And this is needed in order that Western nations, NATO nations came here with investments and once these companies come with strategic investment, I am convinced that this will be the start of the irreversible process and it will stop uh, Russian aggression and it uh, will provide us victory. This is a specific sector. It is strategic for whole, uh, all countries and these decisions are taken only when all preconditions will be uh, will exist in Ukraine and when these companies come Western governments will uh, do much more in order to support and stabilize situation here. And uh, then it will uh, go to the level of geopol uh, poli uh, policy and uh, the negotiation process uh, level, uh, negotiations with uh, Russia, an aggressive state, because it is directly interested in uh, uh, non-development of our uh, in the fans industry. Thank you. Sanctions, which is actually important for understanding of the general landscape for, you know, uh, global uh, arms trade market and uh, Ukrainian uh, potential position there. <coughs> so, it, it, I think it's important, uh, given just the uh, statements in the last uh, several weeks, uh, actually the last few days, about a number of the uh, European uh, leaders uh, uh, who said, well, let's uh, reduce sanctions, so let's uh, bring uh, Putin back into the uh, uh, discussions and so forth and not, not uh, have him isolated. Um, I think the danger of that cannot be overstated. It essentially uh, raises the potential of Ukraine being politically outflanked and overrun isolated. And uh, so I, I think it's important to sort of look at both where the origins of those were, but also uh, remedies for Ukraine. Uh, it's interesting, the most effective sanction for the first four years of this war, and it is a war, I understand why people uh, felt it was important not to declare it a war, because it, it, all Putin wanted to do was have Ukraine declare war on Russia to give him an excuse. So yeah, it was an anti-terrorist operation. <clears throat> but these were terrorists armed with tanks and artillery. Uh, and it's been now four years of uh, a brutal uh, uh, combat, uh, a war by any uh, realistic definition. So initially, the Germans, French, Americans uh, avoided uh, wanting to uh, give uh, lethal assistance to Ukraine. And the alternative then was to have sanctions, uh, uh, treat uh, Putin as a pariah, not, not talk to him and so forth. But, but it's important to remember that those were alternatives to helping the victim of aggression. 
In fact, <clears throat> up until January of this year, uh, the most effective sanction of this war wasn't against Russia, it was against, it was against Ukraine. It was a total and complete embargo uh, on giving lethal aid to the victim of aggression. Uh, and for all of his other personality uh, quirks uh, or innovations, uh, President Trump <clears throat> broke that embargo. Uh, and not only broke it for the United States by sending javelins, but then opened the gates for others for defense cooperation. So when the Western countries say, oh, well, let's, uh, let's uh, uh, bring uh, sanctions down and bring Putin back to the table, um, it, it then raises a, a, a very serious issue for Ukraine. Uh, is Ukraine going to be left uh, essentially politically isolated in what uh, people call the bloodlands you know, for 100 years? Uh, Eastern Europe has essentially been the... Uh, the place where um, big powers struggle and uh, the people who live there bleed. And I think then the question is, what can Ukraine do to, uh, to address that? Uh, and I think uh, often there's a tendency, Ukraine's not a superpower, so the natural tendency is to look for others for help. But I think there's a, a lot, Ukraine needs to take now responsibility for its own survival. And, um, and take the initiative. Uh, one of those initiatives, I think, is uh, increasing uh, the effort to become a NATO member. Uh, NATO is not a perfect alliance, but it is a military alliance that not only pulls together people with common values, but it, by being linked politically, economically, and militarily to the United States, it also provides a strategic deterrent to an aggressor. He knows that if he attacks the Baltics, for example, t today, or if Ukraine was a member, he uh, is risking not just conventional war, but um, uh, the danger of nuclear war. And that is an enormous deterrent, uh, particularly for Ukraine, because Ukraine, uh, under the Budapest Agreement, gave up its access to nuclear weapons and its own deterrent. So uh, I think what's often lost in the discussion in Ukraine, it's not just a matter of, of sort of joining the West and being part of the team, but it is a critical cover for the country. And uh, I, I think at this time when the Europeans in particular and other politicians go, oh, let's be friendly with Putin, let's get him back in, let's have discussion, fine. Then let's get Ukraine and NATO. And let's do it now. The sooner the better. Now, there's sort of two arguments uh, that people uh, use against that. One uh, is the, uh, and I'm going to use Germany as an example, because they tend to be both economic and politically very uh, powerful in their, uh, their influence and their position. Uh, and the Germans, uh, uh, and they've also been pretty articulate about it. And they go, well, uh, in, uh, to be a member of NATO, you shouldn't have a, uh, a conflict ongoing uh, with somebody else. So you have to end these other conflicts before you can be a, a member of NATO. I spent most of my professional life uh, from the late 60s up until the end of the Cold War <laughs> defending Germany. Right? I go, are you kidding? I mean, if the rules that Germany would apply to Ukraine today to keep NATO, Ukraine out of NATO, Germany never would have been allowed in NATO. It was divided. If it hadn't been put in, in, in NATO, uh, they would probably still be divided. Maybe the Cold War wouldn't have even ended. So he said, what, what, what hypocrisy? Uh, you benefited, you Germany benefited from uh, even being divided in a conflict zone uh, by joining the alliance and having the alliance support you and you expanded and, and built your democracy. Um, so I, I, th I think that, that hypocrisy needs to be confronted, conf confronted uh, directly. The second issue is, uh, uh, what does Ukraine bring to the alliance? So we use the term reform a lot. It's popular here in Ukraine, it's popular in NATO. So for the last 25 years, NATO has been on a m military reform. What did that mean? Well, essentially, it was uh, we want to reduce the size of military establishments, so we save money. 
Uh, we want to put uh, civilians in charge. Uh, and generally, who's in charge of the military uh, uh, are not military people who know how to run operations, but rather po politicians who come out of the parliament, increasingly with no military experience at all. And yet they're making decisions on procurement, on commitments, and so forth. They, they have no factual basis to, and I'm not in, in favor of militarism. There is, I think, an important political layer but the idea that uh, people who have no military experience are going to uh, redesign. And then the third uh, is ridiculous. And the third, uh, the third NATO reform or European reform was to go light. Oh, well, we don't, there's no threat in Europe, so uh, we can just uh, lighten our forces and we'll go off and uh, be policing the third world in Afghanistan and Iraq and so forth. So, and the assumption was that Russia was a security partner and Russia was not a threat to Europe. Well, when they invaded Crimea, started the war in the Donbass, and was organized, uh, uh, commanded, provided the equipment, and then in late summer of 14 and the winter of 15, directly intervened. Um, and then threatening the, the Baltics, threatening Poland, running these big Zapad exercises that are essentially uh, oriented to overrunning uh, uh, Eastern Europe. Um, when Russia begins doing these things, the, uh, uh, the, the question is, what, what does NATO now do? So NATO said, okay, well, Warsaw and several of the summits, they go, okay, we're going to increase our defense spending. Well, the Baltics and Poland are spending everything they can, and they're meeting their requirement. Then you look at Western Europe, and you go, uh, Germany, the richest country in NATO, the single biggest beneficiary of NATO in the last 70 years, uh, is only doing half of its defense expenditure. And the, and the uh, Germans say, well, we don't want to build a bigger army. We, we don't want to put more brigades and more tanks and so on. Fair enough. Who's going to defend Eastern Europe? Uh, so then I turn and I look at, uh, at Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine has uh, been at war for four years. You've lost uh, 10,000 dead, 40,000 seriously wounded. One and a half million people displaced. I turn to my friends in NATO and I go, which country, which of you could have lasted that long? Militarily, politically, or psychologically? And they generally kind of look down. Uh, Ukraine is because you had inherited a lot of old Russian ammunition. By my count, you fired, your army has fired more ammunition than are in the stocks of all the NATO countries on the continent. I say, well, let's look at the future. Uh, and I go, uh, this Ukrainian army, which had trouble in 14, uh, uh, and suffered terribly in the winter. I was there, I witnessed it, uh, in the Russian winter offensive of 15. But there's a whole new generation of young Ukrainian commanders. Uh, in my view, some of the best combat commanders in the world. I brought several of them to the United States. And you have uh, 1,200 American officers sitting there in rapt attention, recognizing um, the, their quality of, of uh, their commandability. Ukraine started the, the, the war with 15 brigades, lost a couple in early. Today, Ukraine has 22 brigades in the field. You have 100,000 combat trained, experienced troops. I don't think the Russians can invade the Baltics or Poland or threaten Eastern Europe as long as that Ukrainian army is, 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 is in the field. So you turn around and you go, this is not just a, an issue of, oh, Ukraine needs NATO. NATO needs Ukraine. A stable, strong Ukrainian military equipped with modern weapons uh, is the key to, to security in Eastern Europe. And it's time to let the West Europeans know, no, you can, you can decide whether you want to have a strong military, you can decide how much money you want. You do not have the right to veto the security of Eastern Europe by preventing the best country uh, for uh, securing uh, Eastern Europe from uh, joining the alliance. So, uh, so I, that's what I, I think is, is the, the key antidote, and we need to start 
uh, saying, we in the United States need to start making that argument. I, but also, I think Ukrainians need to start making that argument. And, uh, and, and seize the moment and say, uh, we're here. We're not going anywhere. We've been fighting for four years, and if we have to, we'll fight for another. We fought for four years when no one would, would uh, give us a single uh, weapon. Um, and we're committed to the security of Eastern Europe. We want to see this war end, uh, and we want to see Europe once again at, at peace and whole. I, I think of an aggressive, uh, more aggressive uh, Ukrainian position. Uh, we, we, is, is the proper antidote right now. And I, and I think it will be backed up by the American Congress and the American people. Um, with respect to uh, defense reform, how do you, up till now, you've essentially uh, provided uh, your own weapons, much of which were old uh, Soviet equipment, a lot of which was very dilapidated. You know, took heavy losses in equipment and pulled out uh, so, uh, I think uh, uh, Ukrainian defense industry, um, which was certainly challenged because they'd been focused mostly on third world sales, uh, came through in the end and, uh, and helped keep this army in the field. Um, and I think they need to be recognized for that. Uh, it doesn't mean that there is, isn't areas that need to be improved or reformed, but uh, uh, the ability of the country to pull together and and uh, and, and continue to stand, uh, I think it it, it it needs to be recognized not just by us in the West but by Ukrainians. I, I, I tell my friends, I go, you, you meet two Ukrainians and you get three opinions. Uh, there is a tendency in Ukraine for self-criticism, and that's that's healthy in a democracy. But it's also healthy to recognize that when uh, the, the power of coming together. And uh, and uh, having a joint mission, and not always being so hypercritical. My last comment would be on reform. Reform has become, a, in my opinion, a shibboleth. It's, it's a, a a word that's thrown around, and we need to stop once in a while and ask, what do we really mean by reform? What what is it? There was a study by uh, a. Uh, Western European uh, uh, country uh, last year on uh, defense reform in Ukraine. They didn't talk about what the army needed. Uh, they didn't talk about uh, uh, how Western military technology and access could help Ukraine. Fifty percent of the report was on gender issues. Now I'm not as a father of two daughters and, and uh, a grandfather of six daughters. I'm all in favor of uh, women's rights, but you know, really, is is gender reform the the, the key to Ukrainian security? Uh, I, 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 and I, I think we need to, to get back to fundamentals, uh, uh, and that those fundamentals are uh, what is the key to what is the critical measure of reform? The critical measure is is your army stronger? Make your forces more effective. Does it send a message to the opponent that if he continues the aggression or escalates the aggression, whether in the Donbass, whether in Crimea, or anywhere along the front, that his losses are going to be horrific, that this is not going to be a quick overrun? Uh, that, to me, is the measure of reform. Everything else is tangential. Now, uh, I remember uh, when I first met Dennis uh, two years ago, uh, he and his... Uh, colleagues were in Washington and the uh, embassy had uh, invited me to meet with them. And uh, it was uh, a bit uh, tense at first. Uh, uh, Mr. Romanov, the uh, then director of Ukraine Born Parma, uh, uh, opened the discussion and he goes, uh, Dr. Carber, why do you call my company Ukraine Born Porn? Which I had in several speeches. And I go, well, I'm not trying to be insulting, but uh, during the winter uh, summer of offensive of 14 and winter offensive of 15, I was at the front with troops, and uh, I witnessed several examples, personally witnessed several examples, of uh, people putting money and uh, personal priorities above the, 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 the uh, security and arming of these kids at the front. And I consider that pornographic. 
they're putting their lives on the line. Every day I, in the winter offensive, somebody was killed that I knew. Um, to have them suffer like that and other people be worried about making a few green, uh, I found um, very offensive. So they said, uh, we're trying to reform Euchre, and uh, they invited me to uh, come. They said, uh, come to the plants. You can walk around. You can talk to design bureaus. You can uh, walk the plant floors uh, unobstructed. And I did. And what I found was uh, some very first class designers. Uh, Ukraine has an outstanding technical talent uh, in their uh, defense industry and, by the way, in their overall scientific uh, uh, sector. Uh, Ukraine, probably more than any, certainly in the, than the United States, has a higher number of students in the technical universities who are, are, are uh, doing fundamental basic research in science uh, than we do. We have a lot of students in the United States studying those things. Unfortunately, they're not American. They're going to be Chinese. Uh, uh, I was impressed by the quality and commitment of the workers on the floor building the, the vehicles. Uh, so I came away and I go, no, this reform, uh, the, the, the reform that is making defense industry more effective and more efficient is uh, going on, is, 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 is making progress. Now, you can always argue, is the glass half full or half empty? But where it was in 14 and 15, it's definitely got more full. So then the last question, I apologize for rambling on, but the last question to me is, okay, where do you go from here? And particularly if you think about what Ukraine can uh, participate in NATO. And I think the key then is, is to uh, focus on uh, taking those talents and dropping the barriers and at the same time being tough about people who would uh, violate the law and uh, try to just exploit things for their personal benefit. Uh, so I'm, I'm all in favor of, uh, of being very tough, but I also think it's important to recognize the, the, the progress that's been, been made and not use reform as an excuse to just be critical, criticize, 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 and, and uh, break down the cohesion of your defense effort. Rather, bring it back together uh, and focus on the real issue. And the real issue, the bottom line, is is it making the military stronger? I want to emphasize, by the way, too, the leadership of the military. Because in the early days, <laughs> this army was struggling. Uh, and everybody knows it. They'd been neglected for 20 years. Um, volunteers were going to the front, but, but they didn't have combined arms. They didn't even know how to call in. They didn't have the radios. They didn't even have the ability to call in artillery support. Uh, that's all changed. Uh, and this army really is ready to, to join NATO. And, and I'd like to highlight the contribution of General Muzhenko, your chief of your army. Uh, probably one of the most criticized people in, in Ukraine. Oh, what about this? What about that? Uh, but this army is radically different. We know it. We see it in the United States. The Russians know it. And in the end, who led that? Maybe made some mistakes, but the overall effect has been very powerful, very positive. And I think taking greater pride in your army and recognizing those who help fill the glass um, is really important to your survival. So I apologize for the long. Oh, I'm fine. Uh, I have my own. Thank you. Thank <coughs> you. Uh, um, Thank you to Mr. Kauber for his uh, fundamental explanation of all elements. And it is only logical to transfer to my expertise today uh, together with the Potomac Foundation. Our center uh, is conducting the research focused on researching how Russia is using military technical cooperation and the arms trade as geopolitical influence <coughs> tool and what hybrid operations are used to, to promote Russia's interests in this sphere and to oppose the development of other countries. We will not 
talk about other countries today because we are focused on Ukraine, but Ukraine today is, as we understand, <coughs> is currently a competitor, important competitor of Russia <coughs> on the global market of weaponry and is capable potentially to def uh, fill the positions which Russia presents at the same markets uh, in the world. And the second is that in R Ukraine is in open conflict uh, with Russia, so Russia is doing, uh, is putting all his efforts into destroying Ukrainian defense industry. Uh, in lessening its competitive ability, as it has already been said in the context uh, of the, the reforms, when we have the shifted focus, in no case uh, here uh, we are not a sexist or anti-female uh, Ku Klux Klan sect, but any reform should have a strategic objective and all activities inside the reform should work for, should contribute to achieving the goal. And you know what are the strategic goals of the reform of defense capacity of Ukraine, defense industry of Ukraine. Mr. Kaber said already about this. All the activities in the governmental sector and non-governmental sector, they should be focused on uh, you improving uh, the Ukraine's defense sector, defense industry, and uh, its capacity should be improved. Each Ukrainian defense sec sector and military should have all necessary uh, means to protect Ukraine, and Ukraine should become a partner of NATO countries. Uh, uh, some of these uh, NATO member countries uh, also so are uh, post-Soviet countries uh, and they still have uh, uh, some uh, weaponry of Soviet times uh, which are on the basis of Ukrainian uh, production capacities so Ukraine could help also. So there are three priorities which uh, uh, of the activities in, in the scope of the reform we are, if we are talking about refocusing, refocusing is not only disrupt trust. Uh, uh, today, in our research, we have several dozen cases which demonstrate how Ukraine and other countries uh, um, may have uh, very nice ideas of uh, combating corruption and uh, transparent conditions on the marketplaces are used uh, not just to this oppose the positions, to destroy the positions of Ukraine on the markets, uh, uh, but uh, to promote Russia. Uh, I would like to summarize, uh, uh, summarize, and I would like to say that we are very thankful to Mr. Kabe for uh, the strategy, for his contribution to the strategy development of Ukraine uh, along with the U.S. and the U.S. USA and the EU countries and in the strategy we are sure there will be aspects which concerns technology, finance, pol policy, international politics and also it would uh, cover the moments of how to oppose these hybrid influences which we experience these days. We have time for questions. So it's a question oriented out you, Christian Wirsch, it's also on television. Uh, we had yesterday again the Normandy format uh, uh, talks about a UN mission uh, for uh, Eastern Ukraine, the positions between uh, mainly Russia and the West um, far from uh, a compromise. Uh, how do you think or how do you evaluate the chances for such a mission? And uh, in which way we can, uh, the West can convince by pressure or uh, 
uh, diplomacy, uh, Russia to agree to a mission would really would be as a chance to end the conflict? Uh, so I'll, I'll give you my personal opinion, which is not U.S. policy right now. But I, I think um, the, 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 the first, uh, you have to reorganize the Normandy format. Uh, you have uh, a major uh, strategic player, Russia, and you have two eunuchs, and then you have the victim of aggression. Uh, the United States should be in the, in the discussions. Um, uh, uh, and it should be five, not four. Uh, uh, and the U.S. and Russia can, then you can have the Europeans and then Ukraine. I, I think you're not going to go anywhere in the, uh, as long as you, you do not have a European, uh, as long as you do not have an effective counterbalance to Russia. And, and quite clearly, uh, France and Germany have not been up to the, to the challenge, either politically or, or militarily. Um, secondly, we need to be uh, honest about uh, the OSCE uh, uh, teams in the Donbass. Um, I think there's some very brave people uh, that put their lives at risk every day trying to monitor things. But the f format for that was deeply flawed in, 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 its, in its design and implementation. Uh, there's 350, 400 people to observe an area that would take 4,000 to effectively observe. Secondly, and this was a hidden dirty secret, uh, when the OSC uh, ob observation of the conflict zone was put in, uh, a small area of Ukraine was, was uh, uh, isolated to, for national purpose and not, uh, was, uh, the observers were not allowed uh, uh, in, very small. Roughly half the area of the Donbass was restricted, a uh, hundred times that side. Not only that, the uh, entire sectors of the of the border were forbidden and the observers have to give advance warning so even if somebody's cheating uh, uh, he, he can move his stuff and hide it before uh, the observers can get there uh, the OSC brought in uh, unmanned aerial vehicles and uh, at one point every single one of them had been shot out of the skies with Russian electronic warfare <laughs> not separatist <laughs> Russian electronic warfare so you go, this, this is a, a horrifically flawed uh, uh, effort. And, and, and that's really the issue then, uh, is, is how do you make it um, uh, a, uh, a coherent and a credible longer term uh, stabilization effort. So the easiest thing is to tell the Russians, cut it out. Uh, stop this, this uh, harassment. Uh, uh, but if they don't want to play, uh, if they want to pretend that they don't control things, we know they do. There's two cores in the in the Donbas: the Donetsk First Corps, the Luhansk Second Corps. All the officers are Russian. Command and control is Russian. And the Zapad exercises last fall, when Russia was doing the uh, uh, exercises across from the North Cape all the way to the Caucasus, uh, in, uh, exercising a war against NATO. The, Dohansk, uh, the Donetsk and Luhansk corps were, were participating in that offensive against NATO. Right? This is an integrated combat capability. So, in my view, the West can either try to uh, uh, increase the OSCE effort, or you need to bring in some serious peacekeepers as opposed to ob observers. Um, I think uh, Swedes. Uh, uh, a number of other countries would be willing to uh, have said they would be willing to put in, uh, and you'd need three or four thousand. Uh, I, I think that would be a contribution uh, and stabilize. The, the best contribution, I, and, and by the way, the, 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 with respect to the, the Mints too, which is violated every day, and by the OSC's uh, own data. Uh, 70 to 80 percent of the violations start on on the separatist or Russian side. Uh, it, it's almost a fraud. 
So if you're going to keep Minsk, and, and, and the Russians uh, say, oh, well, you know, you have to have a, you have to have a reconstruction, you have to give money here. You're going, Wait a minute. The clock doesn't start on Minsk until the violence stops. And the violence hasn't stopped. Pe people are dying every week, almost every day. So it's, it's time to have a clarity and truth, in my opinion, on this. And by being straight and not getting caught up in the fog of the Russian narrative um, I, 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 is, is, to me, the best antidote. Um, uh, so I, I hope that, that answered your, or addressed your, your question. Панове, дякую вам. На жаль, нас зовсім вичерпався час, тому вимушені завершувати. Ще раз дякую усім. Our time is up. Thank you. Till the next time. Goodbye.